wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and greetings from the University Malaya Center for Civilization and Dialog UMCCD. A warm welcome to the University Malaya for the UMCCD Lecture Series 3 by our honorable speaker Mr. Azrail Muhammad Amin the CEO of Institute Masa Depan Malaysia and Forum of the Role of Youth in Civilization and Sustainability. To begin our program this morning, I would like to invite the Deputy Director of University Malaya Center for Civilization and Dialogue to give his welcoming speech. Please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Zulil Hamzu Kipri Lubes. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. Ana very good morning. Alhamdulillah allazi anzala ala abdihi kitab wa lam yaj'alnahu iwaja. Thank you uh, Mr. Ahmad our chair speaker for today. Uh, Assalamualaikum and very good morning to Mr. Azrul Muhammad Amin, uh, Chief Executive Officer of Institute Masa Depan Malaysia Masa, Mr. Faisal Abdul Aziz, President of Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia, Habib uh, we have here with us today too Mr. Muhammad Hafiz Nudin, Director of Finance in Yayasan Teach for Malaysia. Our moderator for the forum, Mr. Sir Professor Dr. Wendy. Uh, lagi, uh, after this, we will be joined by Ms. Tama, Mr. Tamafila too. And uh, delegates from all the respect, respected institutions, so you see that we have uh, Sukadar Kamisho too today, Warga Yustimlaya and fellow participants. I would like to convey the salam uh, from the director of Muslim Malaya Center of Civilization and Dialogue, uh, Professor Dr. Dr. Atizan Baharudin, who could not be with us today uh, as she is in Putrajaya uh, for her official appointment as the advisory member of Anti-Corruption Commission Malaysia. Therefore, uh, I, Yudul Ham, as the deputy director on behalf of UMCCD, I would like to wish everyone thank you for being here and together we will listen to Mr. Azriel's lecture this morning. Yeah. I would like to highlight the participants uh, of today's event that especially the youth or young people that we have to accept the fact that Malaysia is a diverse and multicultural society due to this, due to this diversity efforts toward creating unity as a quadro Malaysia need to be complemented through continuous integration efforts thus it is important to introduce the concept of civilizational dialogue as a tool because dialogue can help us to self-understand as well as allow the discovery of similarities and differences among cultures. I will now read the CV of our plenary speaker today, uh, Mr. Azri Muhammad Amin. Mr. Azri Muhammad Amin has more than 18 years of extensive experience as a legal practitioner and leader of NGO, non-governmental organization, and engagement with leading research institutions in regional and international settings. From 2017 to 2019, he was the founder and the co-chairperson for the Malaysian Alliance of Civil Society Organizations in the UPR process, a coalition of more than 50 leading civil society organizations with the specific aim of looking into and advocating human rights issues. So, it is an organization championing human rights issues at the United Nations Human Rights Council UPR process. While in that position, among other responsibilities, he conducted research and co-edited a stakeholder's report for the Malaysia's third cycle of the United Nations Human Rights Council. Prior to that, in 2014, he founded uh, the Center, Center for Human Rights Research and Advocacy, CENTRA, serving as a team leader in the operations of the Refugee and Stateless Children Project, supervising recruitment and training of undergraduates from various local universities and instances of CENTRA, doing financial and human resource management and participating in fundraising among other duties. He shared his views in many major international arena, notably the Reykjavik Roundtable on Human Rights in 2016 with the team Democratic Accountability, State Sovereignty and International Governance in April 2016. He also presented his views at the Conference of Myanmar's Democratic Transition and Rohingya persecution organized by the Southeast Asia Research Cluster in 2016. Apart from that, he is also active with the Islamic tradition, human rights discourse, and Muslim communities 
hosted by Oxford Center of Islamic Studies in the United Kingdom. Uh, given his accomplishment and productivity, Encik Azri earned a number of accolades and educational scholarships along the way, including the Japanese Airlines Summer Scholarship for Participation at the Asia Forum in Tokyo and Kanazawa, Japan, and the United Kingdom Foreign and Commonwealth Office Chivering Scholarship, a very reputable scholarship for a master's program at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, University of London. So between April and 2020 and August 2021, uh, he was special officer to the eighth prime minister, Ya Amat Kumhormat, Tan Sri Datuk Haji Mujidin Yassin, with his job scope on specific areas on research and policy. He also oversaw the implementation of policies and ministerial level programs of seven ministries, encompassing social and Islamic affairs cluster. He was also in charge of advising the prime minister in the drafting of keynote addresses and speeches. So, without any further ado, I would like to invite uh, the Honourable Mr. Adriel to deliver his plenary lecture today. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and very good morning um, uh, Yang berbahagia uh, Associate Professor Dr. Zul Ilham Rubis Deputy Director UNCCD um, Seterusnya Associate Professor Dr. Wen Yi Yi Mi Mi uh, Who is the moderator for, um, from the Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment in Chitra UM panel of uh, distinguished uh, speakers uh, in, the, in the panel session, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students of Yunus Malaya and friends. Uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, praise be to Allah, uh, this morning we are able to uh, to meet on this on a Monday morning, but a day to, to have a, a public lecture. That's why I said it should be instead uh, just a special address. Um, I have uh, several disadvantages here, I have to admit. Number one, I just came back from Jeddah uh, last Saturday. Uh, I'm still not recovering fully from uh, jet lag and so I'm having some, some cough and uh, running nose. Uh, secondly, uh, this is a very tough, a very challenging subject matter. And I have decided that uh, during my uh, stay in Jeddah for a week, uh, I was attending the YC session on uh, Independent Permanent Human Rights Commission and um, I decided to put my thoughts into uh, writing um, so that uh, I do not go off tangent in terms of my speech and this is, uh, like I said, this is a very tough subject, role of youth in civilization and sustainability but uh, perhaps during the uh, panel discussion we will be able to uh, share more of your ideas and thoughts with uh, the audience. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, firstly I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate uh, University Malaya Centre for Civilizational Dialogue, UMCCD, for organising the UMCCD lecture, series number three, and youth forum on the role of youth in civilization and sustainability. On behalf of MASA, Institute of Masa Malaysia, of which I am the Chief Executive, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to Professor Dr. Otazizan Bahruddin. She texted me yesterday, last night, that she couldn't make it because uh, she has to attend another important event in the SPRM. Uh, I'm glad that Dr. Zul is here this morning in, in, uh, in replacement. Um, congratulate, uh, congratulations and thank, thanks a lot for inviting me to deliver this special address in this meaningful event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the theme of today's forum is particularly relevant at this moment in the history of Malaysia, the history of the ASEAN region and indeed the history of the world. Let me tell you why. The world of my generation, my father's generation, even my grandfather's generation existed within the framework of a fixed international order established after World War II. Broadly speaking, this was the era of globalization and neoliberal economic trade. The system was managed by American security control over the seas, facilitating free trade, sprawling supply chains, 
and connecting developing economies around the world to Western industrial powers, which were squarely at the center. The preceding generations did our best to help Malaysia thrive within this framework. But that framework is now being dismantled at an accelerating pace. Young people today are entering into a new era, a new paradigm, and the new global order is shifting. We are moving rapidly towards a deglobalized world, and the transition is not without peril. Roughly half of the countries in the developed world are undergoing population collapse, and the rest are in significant decline. Their civilization is in a sustainability crisis, or more precisely, a mortality crisis. As a result, European nations are shifting from the center to the periphery. This is what has been called the pivot to Asia. Events like the war in Ukraine and more specifically, the subsequent economic isolation of Russia, which is creating a global economic disaster of immeasurable proportions, must be understood in the context of this historic transition of world power dynamics. And we, we must consider and prepare for the repercussions on our region and on our country. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, especially the young, your generation, your, the young generation has a task ahead of you that is not less challenging or less important than that, the generation, my generation, my father's generation and my grandfather's generation who all saw Malaysia's independence 65 years old, uh, 65 years ago. They we created a Malaysia that could succeed in the framework of our day, that is a new day and must create a new Malaysia. What sustainability means for a civilization is largely determined by the context in which that civilization exists. But one thing is always going to be true, and this is important. A truly great civilization is one in which each generation views itself as a link in a continuum so that they will make decisions as a link in a continuum so that they will make decisions with the intention of equipping and empowering their successors with the tools and resources necessary to perpetuate that civilization in the future what we have done before is to to, to prepare the next generation the future generation as your generation moves into leadership alhamdulillah you will go armed with the benefits of many decisions that your forebears made. I would like to talk about some of this because I truly believe that these historic cross crossroads are we are approaching, this transformation of the global order is a moment for which our civilization is uniquely prepared. From the very beginning, Malaysia has been a nation deeply protective of our sovereignty and independence and we have always resisted polarization in international relations. As a member of the non-aligned movement, or NAM, we have always maintained a wisely self-interested impartiality in world affairs, which is necessary to preserve our autonomy and to safeguard our national interests. This ethos of non-alignment, of independence, may make us the target of pressure and criticism from those who wish to make to, take, to make us take sides, but it also makes us invulnerable to bullying. We adopted this mentality at a time when the world was divided between two superpowers, US and USSR, and when many nations succumbed to the temptation of subservience to either the US or to the USSR in exchange for safety as a client state. The approach, this approach did not pan out for those countries in the long term. Acquiescence is not a strategy for a nation's sus sustainability. Your predecessors took the hard road and built Malaysia on their own terms, and you have inherited that spirit. In the years ahead, this mindset will remain the key to our success as a civilization, and you will have to manifest this independent spirit into real policies and actions that will ensure that you and future generations will never be forced into compromises that undermine our long-term sustainability. What do I mean by this in practical terms? We have an example in the government's handling of the COVID-19 crisis, which saw Malaysia rapidly achieve universal vaccination faster than any Western country. 
judicious economic management, we were able to navigate through every st stage of the MCO without resorting to loans from international financial institutions. And this is very important. The government, under the able leadership of Malaysia's eighth prime minister at the time, Tan Sri Nuruddin Muhammad Yassin, took swift action to uplift the Rakyat's welfare, such as the eight stimulus packages worth not less than 500 billion ringgit, which benefited, benefited over 20 million people and saved 2.7 million jobs. All these policies and actions preserved our independence and sovereignty. I'm not saying this because he was my boss, but because it is the reality. The government took swift actions to help the, to the rakyat from uh, suffering, yeah, uh, from, from losing their jobs and so to the several economic stimulus packages. During the darkest days of the pandemic, we were given a glimpse of what Malaysia's youth can achieve. Young people from all walks of life exhibited fearless, solid, fearless solidarity in helping strengthen their communities. Among us in this uh, hall, I, I, I believe that there are among us in, in this hall who were actually involved as frontliners, yeah, those who came out to volunteer, uh, either as, uh, as medical frontliners or uh, those who helped to distribute food and, and other things. Reminding us that the government is not alone in this battle. The exemplary roles of young leaders who showcase the true Malaysian spirit from the grassroots to the global level has indeed been inspiring. I believe Chair Hafiz will be able to share with us a uh, teach of Malaysia, what they have uh, been able to do, uh, you know, sharing uh, education opportunities with schools in rural areas. Malaysia has emerged from the worst wave of the pandemic and continues to make strides in terms of economic recovery but we are now confronted, unfortunately, by a tsunami of challenges stemming from the Ukraine war and the, effect, the effective removal of Russia from the global economy. Rampant inflation, food and energy shortages worldwide and the accelerating progress, process of deglobalization will require an even greater spirit of solidarity and commitment to non-alignment if we are to thrive as a nation. We are increasingly going to see developing countries adopting policies of food nationalism, this is what's happening now, and energy protectionism, and every nation's self-sufficiency is going to become paramount. But at the same time, we must maintain and strengthen regional cooperation and solidarity, understanding that helping each other does not make us more vulnerable, but stronger. And self-sufficiency is not the same as isolation. You must, for instance, be guided by the prophetic tradition وسلم, that says, He is not a believer whose stomach is filled while his neighbor goes hungry. What this requires in practical terms is not more agricultural export restrictions, but rather greater agricultural production, perhaps re subsistence, farming alongside farming for expectation uh, for exportation. Ladies and gentlemen, deglobalization is inevitable, but it does not have to be a process that simply happens to us. We can explore proactive strategies for sustainable decoupling, replacing globalization with greater economic regionalization because ASEAN as a bloc is far from resilient and powerful than as individualized countries. At the global level, Malaysia and the ASEAN region generally possess unique demographic advantages. The populations of nearly the entire developed world are aging faster than we are in, in the real, real European countries. For example, we are seeing that they are, they are facing a crisis of uh, aging population, but there are more younger people on this part of the world. Our importance as a consumer group, a labor and talent pool a source of natural wealth and human potential is making our nation and our region the geopolitical and economic center of the world. Getting into the details of the challenges we face and our options for addressing them is beyond the scope of this talk. But I simply want to highlight the reality of the changing geopolitical and economic landscape our youth are inheriting. To emphasize that this generation of young people 
have both an enormous responsibility and a tremendous opportunity to shape the destiny of Malaysia. We must be prepared to make bold changes in charting the way forward to promote an inclusive sustainability agenda in line with the 2030 Agenda of Sustainable Development Goals SDG or in the context of Malaysia, the Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama or the Shared Prosperity Vision of 2030. Youth-driven and community-centered policies require all parties to join hands and prioritize change in ensuring a level playing field which includes providing platforms for young people's participation across various fields so that they can translate their ideas and aspirations into reality. Young people today are best placed to lead this transformation as they are agents of change with the most innovative ideas holding the key to the nation's development. We must work collectively to build a robust ecosystem with both local and regional support networks in place one that is sustainable and inclusive and which can, which can provide fresh impetus for addressing rising economic and social conundrums ranging from inflation and disparities in income to combating environmental challenges and ensuring food security. By adopting a whole of nation approach, it enables us to synergize our efforts towards advocating and accelerating SDGs in the local context particularly in the areas of sustainable financing, climate action, and technology. People are also about, uh, talking about green financing, green tech financing. Uh, for example, in the sector of additive manufacturing and 3D painting, Malaysia has recognized phenomenal economic potential while adhering to the three fundamental R's of sustainability, reduce, reuse, and recycle. Localizing SDGs obliges us to engage discussions at grassroots levels by encouraging participation of the youth in the creative implementation of the SDGs. Through youth, through youth empowerment, policy-making processes can be injected with a shot of dynamism and imagination in charting solutions to social and environmental challenges. Undeniably, we are at the crossroads with regards to climate action. The recent occurrence of flash floods in various parts of our country may just be the tip of an iceberg. In pursuit of the climate and change agenda, it is therefore imperative that we strengthen our preparedness for climate change from tackling natural disasters, reducing carbon footprint and transitioning to a greener and less fossil fuels dependent, dependent future to become carbon neutral by 2050. Malaysia's, local, uh, Malaysia's location and climate uniquely positions us to advance in solar energy. And even amidst the pandemic, the government allocated billions of ringgits for the installation of new grids, LED, street lights, and rooftop solar panels. These measures are not only good for the environment, but they establish custodial control over the distinct resource of Malaysia's sunlight, which could eventually be sought as an energy source for the cooler darker countries of the global north, providing future Malaysians with a valuable potential export and greater economic leverage. These are the types of decisions made by the past and present leaders to equip our youth to shape a better future for our country. We can do better, the young generation can do better. And the launch of uh, my digital initiative early last year, for example, serves, serves as a catalyst to drive the digital agenda, aiming to create over 500,000 digital-related jobs and contributing 22.6% of the nation's GDP by 2025. Ladies and gentlemen, while we place a great deal of emphasis on technology, development, manufacturing opportunities and so on, we must also be wary of rapid and excessive urbanization and neglect towards traditional and strategically vital economic sectors like fishing and agriculture. Urbanization is correlated to declining birth rates and we need to ensure that our population continues to meet replenishment minimums. Our demographic advantage is one of our biggest strengths and we have to be careful to avoid 
the common pitfall associated with development that is shrinking development. Our greatest, our greatest resource is our people. Malaysia has built such a vibrant multiracial country as rightly pointed out by Dr. Zul. And we should capitalize on the advantage of this multiracial diversity protected under the canopy of Islam as the religion of the, the Federation as enshrined, enshrined in the Federal Constitution. By celebrating our richness in diversity, we can strengthen our social cohesion over time to achieve the common goal of national unity. In this regard, we must eschew what divides and look at what unites us. By accepting cultural differences, and what I mean by accepting is actually respecting cultural differences, not tolerating. I don't like to use the word tolerate, because when you tolerate, you show a smiling face, but you keep it differently in your heart. So I think by respecting and accepting cultural differences, practicing empathy and building partnerships towards national integration. Youth empowerment can go a long way towards fostering greater unity when complemented by various integration efforts. To this end, we can appreciate the importance of the dialogue of civilizations in engaging with the younger generation. It is only through interactive dialogues like the lecture series today that we can continuously cultivate an intellectual discourse on the concept of civilizational dialogues. Such an initiative certainly bodes well in promoting meaningful interaction and mutual understanding towards a peaceful and sustainable world. Only one tip to have dialogues on Monday mornings. <laughs> you won't get any young people to come. We have come a long way, and together we can do more. It is time for all parties to join forces and galvanize their efforts so that the fruits of prosperity and sustainability can be shared with every citizen. This is the spirit of the shared prosperity vision that our government is now putting into our 12 and also in the recent budget announcement by the Prime Minister. The future of our gen next generation is our shared responsibility, so let us work to, uh, together across all aspects of society for a better future. With the right synergy and support, youth can flourish to become future leaders in spending the nation's development agenda towards achieving the aspirations of the SDGs and Wawasan Kemakmuran Bersama 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, when I am reflecting on the dramatic transformation of the global order and the many daunting challenges that lie ahead of us, I admit that I worry as a father, as a Malaysian, as someone engaged every day in the issues that confront us. But it is when I look at the youth with their energy and optimism enthusiasm, creativity, and with their compassion, faith, and confidence, as I am looking out at all of some of you now, my worries turn to assurance and hope. The challenges are tough, but you are tougher, smarter, and your spirit is undefeatable. It is not mere hyperbole to say that we are beginning an era in which we can achieve civilizational greatness, and I firmly believe that your generation will take us there. Lastly, I would like to commend the efforts by the UMCCD for turning this forum into a reality. It is my hope that this event will produce constructive exchanges of dialogue and ideas for the betterment of the younger generation and the value it offers towards the nation's recovery. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention means a lot to me. I am very grateful that you have listened to me today. I wish all of you a fruitful deliberation. Thank you. We will be back with you Hidayah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good day. Thank you to Mr. Azrael Muhammad Amin for the speech today. Now I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Zul Ilham Zulkifli Lubes to come on the stage to give you MCC this token of appreciation. Please welcome. Now 
I would like to invite to our moderator and panel members to take uh, to come in front for the group photo session. Thank you again to Mr. Azri Mahmoudin, CEO of Institute Masa Depan Malaysia for the special lecture. Now I would like to invite our moderator and panel members to take their seat on the stage, begin our forum. Before we start the forum, please welcome Associate Professor Dr. Zul Ilham Zulkifli Lubes to introduce our moderator today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahmad. So before, before we move on to the forum, uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Azrael for his uh, lecture just now. We could take notes uh, on various youth rules that is paramount uh, for us to fulfill the shared prosperity vision of Malaysia as well as to realize the sustainable development goals in 2020. So I would like to take some time to introduce our moderator today, Associate Professor Dr. Wendy. So, Associate Professor Dr. Wendy Yi is the Director at the Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment, CITRA, University of Malaya. She specializes in the field of youth development, inter-ethnic relations, global citizenship education, and peace education. So, those are the big words today. So, she has close to 20 years of teaching and research experience with the Institution of Higher Education. In her capacity as an academic, she has developed a course on introduction to peace and humanity studies and through this course, she has trained many young students to become peace advocates and transform them to become valuable members in the society. Dr. Wendy Yi is currently an international fellow at the King Abdullah bin Abdul Aziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, KAISIP, a very reputable fellowship of a world-renowned institution that trains people to pursue interfaith dialogue for peace. The current work as a fellow in KAISIP is to develop a module that integrates the elements of GCED into interfaith and intercultural dialogue. Her scholarly achievements have also been recognized by the Institute of Youth Research under the Ministry of Youth and Sports Malaysia, where she has been appointed as the think tank for this national institute. Looking at the national youth related matters, including developing the Youth National Index. She has published in, of course, international journals, books, and also presented papers in both, both local and international conferences. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Wendy to take over from me and moderate the forum. Dr. Wendy, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Zul. Thank you so much for your very kind <laughs> introduction. So, uh, once again, a very good morning to Associate Professor Dr. Zul, Deputy Director of CCD, our um, Inge Azriel, CEO of MASA. That was a great, uh, what, what do you call? <laughs> we were saying we were using a several terms this morning. It was a key, special address, lecture series, keynote. <laughs> so, we were discussing which term we should be actually using. But that, that was really a great one. Thank you so much. And of course, to our distinguished panelists and all participants. So once again, on behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you for your presence in today's lecture series entitled The Role of Youth in Civilization and Sustainability. 
Now with me this morning, I have three very, very, very distinguished panelists. You know, as I was going through their CV, you know, the night before, I was so amazed with their achievements, actually, you know, despite a very, very young age. So now let me introduce to you our first panelist. Our first panelist sitting next to me is Encik Muhammad Faisal bin Abdul Aziz. Cik Faisal and I are actually from the same kampung. I'm not sure whether you realize that, in Mali. <laughs> yes, so Cik Faisal has co actually completed two bachelor's degree, one uh, from IIUM. Yeah, so one is the bachelor's degree of Sharia, the second one is actually the bachelor's of law, and then he pursued his master's degree of laws from UITM. He is currently holding the position as the president of Muslim Youth Movement Malaysia, or in short, ABIM. Besides being very active in ABIM, Cik Faisal is also playing very significant roles in SDG-related matters. He is the lead coordinator team for all party parliamentary group, and among the many significant works he has done, includes localizing the sustainable development goals with the pilot project study of 10 parliamentary constituencies in seven states, namely Kedah, Selangor, Pahang, Trunganu, Johor, Sabah, and Sarawak. Now, besides working, working very hard to ensure that we all have a safe and clean environment, Cik Muhammad Faisal also works very hard to ensure that all Malaysians have a clean and fair election. He was the deputy chairman or chairperson for the Coalition for Clean and Fair Election, or Insha Bursik, from 2018 to 2020. He also sits as board of directors in two youth NGOs, which are Adapt Youth Garage and Global Peace Mission Malaysia. And finally, some of you might have also read his articles before in Malaysia Kini Portal because he is also a columnist for Malaysia Kini Portal. So, Chik Faisal, we are so proud and so honored to have you with us this morning. Next. Now, my second panelist today. I would like to introduce to you the face of a true genius. He scored 10 A's with 9 A plus and 1 A for his SPM examination. I have no idea how he did that. I have no clue. Probably we can actually interview and ask him about what's the secret to his amazing results. So this genius is none other than Mr. Tama Pillay. Mr. Tama Pillay received his bachelor's degree in mining engineering from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University. Mr. Tama Pillay is also the advocacy director and co-founder of Undi Lapan Plus Malaysia. And under his leadership, he has achieved a historic triple constitutional amendment to lower the voting age in Malaysia from 21 to 18 years old, increasing the voting population by 5.8 million Malaysians. He is also the managing director for Reimagine Now Sandria Braha, the executive director for NGO Hub Asia, which aims to transform the corporate social responsibility sector via streamlining and optimizing aid from corporations and beneficiaries. He is active involvement in NGOs and incredible passion in democracy-related activities has earned him many prestigious awards and recognition both locally and abroad. He received the August Man, Man of the Year Award in 2021 and this recognition is part of a cohort of creative individuals who are driven by their fiery passion and ever-growing spirit of success. Mr. Tama Pillai also received the Forbes 30 Under 30 Asia Awards in 2021 in recognition for his bright and innovative millennial and Gen Z leaders who have, pre uh, who have persevered and thrived despite global uncertainty. Now, in the same year, he also received the Suwaram Human Rights Award in recognition for his, for his efforts in pushing for democratic reform and change in Malaysia. So, when his presence here this morning, I'm very, very certain that the panel today will be very dynamic, filled with passion and fire. The final panelist I would like to introduce this morning is Encik Muhammad Hafiz bin Nodi. Encik Muhammad Hafiz is also a genius who's got 10 A's for his SPM examination as well. <laughs> so we have a lot of genius on the panel today. So he's currently pursuing his master's degree in developmental studies from the Faculty of Economics and Administration, University Malaya. 
His area of studies focuses on the philosophy of development, sustainability, and poverty. He is currently working with an NGO whose profession is very close to my heart, which is Teach for Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. He works as a finance and operations director. Injit Muhammad Hafiz was working in PricewaterhouseCooper Consulting as a manager between March 2020 to November 2021. As a manager, he has led the implementation of WAF investment product from pre-emergency WAF fund set to set up in Malaysia. He also led the development of distribution framework and policies to provide cash assistance to B40 entrepreneurs. More significantly, Cheikh Hafiz has designed and delivered business and social impact continuity consultancy sessions to 25 social enterprises, enterprises to scale their enterprises during the COVID-19 pandemic. From 2019 to 2020, he was acting as the financial expert for Alta D. Little Strategy Consulting based in Riyadh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. In his advisory role, he focuses on delivering financial review and assessment in the financial transformation in the Ministry of Health in that kingdom. The total number of facilities covered was 25 hospitals and 51 primary health clinics. Besides being an expert in financial matters, Jake Hafiz is also very much involved in sustainable development activities. Between 2017 to 2019, he was the assistant manager for business development and responsible investing in Synergy C. Surya Prahat, dealing with renewable energy. With that, he has led four business development engagement to promote rooftop solar and energy efficient projects in northern region of Malaysia, as well as the development of sustainable school program that brings renewable energy solutions to private and public schools in the country. Wow, that was a mouthful, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to impress on you know on our audience. We have such distinguished panelists, you know, with us this morning, and they're so young, and that is really amazing. Okay, so I'll, I guess I'll stop there. So with all these amazing panelists uh, we have this morning, let us begin our session. So I'll start by asking each of our panelists to share your views and perspective with regards to the role of youth, okay, in championing civilization and sustainability in a plural and diverse society such as Malaysia. Now each panelist will have five minutes to share your views on that topic. So probably I'll start with you, Faisal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Associate Professor Wendy, my esteemed uh, panelist, Tama Billy and Mr. Hafiz, not to forget uh, Mr. Azrael from Mas Institute Masa. Thank you for sharing a good stuff. Actually, Mr. Azrael uh, was Vice President of ABIM. And not to forget also uh, our neighbor, Saka Gakai. The office just next door to ABIM. Uh, uh, our friend from Institute Masa and uh, members of the floor. And also Professor Zuhelmi uh, from UM Centre for Civilization, Civilization and Dialogue. Okay, uh, my first take. I think uh, before I proceed, uh, I think we will agree that uh, we organize this forum uh, on one premise that we are now in a polarized society. When we are talking about polarized society, it doesn't mean that uh, just only in Malaysia, but also across the globe. And when I talk about polarized society or polarization, it doesn't mean that we are within the context of racial or religious uh, community per se but also in terms of economic class, social class, and many other aspects. Even uh, within uh, uh, one homogeneous community, we can see there are huge gap. There are a lot of identities because of a lot of information being fed through social media. And the thing that I would highlight, the issue of disinformation. I think uh, when we talk about disinformation, uh, you know, certain uh, false information being propagated by certain quarters, irresponsible parties, for example, to huge or to extend a gap between within our polarized community. So that's why now we live in this polarized society. We always look at the differences. Yes, of course, we need to appreciate differences, but at the end of the day, we always look at the differences. When we we have a lot of issues, there are a bunch of issues. We always see that through the perspective of differences. Be it vaccine, 
we have a lot of identities like anti vax or vax, uh, pro refugees, anti refugees, political uh, differences, for example, Islamophobia, xenophobia. There are a lot of differences. People or the young people, I think, we tend to look at the differences uh, as compared to what can unite us when we talk about certain issues. And when we talk about this information, what concerns us more is about the youth because youth are the main consumers of social media. When we talk about information being fed through social media, of course, and I'm afraid, I hope uh, it is not uh, true. Maybe uh, people perceive youth as uh, the, the community that, that are susceptible to this information uh, problem that we are facing right now. And uh, so, uh, for, for us, engagement matters, and that's why we need to have like this forum to redirect the youth, to have more interactions, dialogue, uh, to look at the similarities, uh, even uh, to have more engagement or interactions. I would like to share, for example, our engagement with FGIS, Friendship Group of Interreligious Services. When we have those kind of engagement, so we can deal with the problem what, be it Islamophobia or racial tensions, religious hatred, for example, in a peaceful way. We can correct the misperception, manipulation by certain quarters, and we can uh, share the real uh, information about what happened in terms of the conflicts that we have right now. And uh, look at the bigger picture when we talk about civilization. Uh, we are the Southeast Asian communities, we have our own legacy the character of building civilization. Uh, even in, in our presentation address, we, we use the term of cosmopolitan Islam, where you know the character of Southeast Asia is full of openness, inclusivity, uh, amenable to cultural diversity. It encapsulates under the term of cosmopolitan, where it is a prerequisite of building the civilization. So that's my first thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pinat. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, can, can you hear me? Here. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I think uh, this conversation is something that's so important, especially while we face a, sort of a global crisis, a national crisis, and a crisis of confidence and of faith. I think this is something that we are facing not only in Malaysia, but it's something that we're facing all around the world. If you, for those who are paying attention for global news, for international news, you realize that in every single country, I think this has Sorry, Faisal mentioned there is issues of polarization, there's issues of uh, you know of uh, disenfranchisement, there's issues of anger. But I think the core element that I want to point out, especially when it talks about civilization, I think when you, when it comes to civilization, it's always a sense of building, right? And you can only build if there is a sentiment or an idea of what you're building towards. So for me, one of the biggest crises that we're facing internationally but also within our country is a crisis of uncertainty which is a crisis of the lack of hope I think that's really the big issue um, of course there's, there's many ways to describe this but I'm just simplifying it in, in I think the, the manner that I think is is most easy to understand which is a crisis of hope a crisis where we are uncertain about our future we are uncertain about the direction of this country we are uncertain about the global economy and we are uncertain about our own selves where will we be in the next five, ten years, right? Are we going to migrate? Are we going to still be in the same place? Uh, is Kuala Lumpur an appropriate place, right? These are all questions that we are asking ourselves, right? I think people on social media, there are so many issues, you know, worried about banjir, uh, this and that. But in the end, I think it goes back to this idea of uncertainty and this discomfort. I think to add to that issue is, of course, this bigger crisis that we are all discussing more and more, the issue of climate change, the issue of a climate emergency, and what can we do in order to reverse certain trends that have been getting worse and worse. Of course, Malaysia is a relatively safe country compared to many other countries that are greater victims of, or at greater risk at climate disasters. However, we are still victims too. Issues of flooding, issues of extreme weather, issues of uh, you know, deforestation, I think these are all affecting us in the end. And I do think that this is something that affects many Malaysians as a whole because it's essentially the idea of what is our future and how do we build towards it. 
So I do think that this is part of the civilizational question that we must ask. How do we ask the right questions and how do we then find the right answers for us to build together and then work, to, work together towards finding this common solution? I think that's where the, the role of youth comes in. I'm a firm believer in youth with only 18. I think, uh, I think as you all know, uh, with 5 million new voters that are coming into the electoral picture, young people are now the majority of voters in this country. So when you look at people who are 18 to 40 years old, uh, you are now about 58% of the electorate. 58% are young people. I think this is an important value because it means that young people have the numbers to chart our country's future and destination, but the question that we will have to ask ourselves in this time of uncertainty, in this time of conflict, in this time of lack of clarity, can we as youth find a common ground? Can we find a common agenda? And can we find a common solution that we can work towards together in order to build a better civilization together, better climate together, and a better future together, whether it is you're talking about a national um, issue, a regional ASEAN level, Asia Pacific issue, or even a global level? I think these are the real questions they want to ask. So I think that's the preamble that I want to give. So really, it's, a, it's big questions that we've got to ask. But together, I think the youth have an immensely important role in answering these questions and finding solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Pillay. Yes, Mr. Hafiz? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, okay, I was, uh, two distinguished speakers <laughs> have already uh, explained very extensively about the role in youth. I just want to echo um, that sentiment. And I think what, what we, can, we, we can obviously see globally, um, like what Greta, the Greta Thunberg effect. Um, and I think in, in what, what that has caused and also shared with us internally in Teach for Malaysia is like basically the power of youth and how it can basically change the world. Uh, as I think what you have heard in uh, Prof. Wendy, when, Dr. Wendy, when, when she was sharing my CV, I, I actually came from corporate background um, and I was working in, in management consulting in PwC. Uh, but I was very surprised when I was, uh, one, one of my portfolios was sustainability. So basically, uh, some of the GLCs that you see, Simon Dalby uh, and some others that cannot be named, uh, they have like sustainability strategy and all that. So that's one of the, the stuff that I do back then. Um, but I think the interesting part that, that I that really opened my eyes is in if we look in sustainability conversations with big corporations 10 years ago, sustainability is just a, a either greenwashing method or it's something that is like, okay, this is like an afterthought, like CSR. But right now, there are more, more and more uh, external factors who think a lot of pressure in incorporations to disclose sustainability. Uh, and I think one thing that, that, was, that I found very interesting two years ago is when I was speaking to uh, like C-suite or, or the man top management of a corporation, they were, I think they spent one hour talking about the Greta Thunberg effect. Uh, and, and this is actually a very, very eye-opening uh, scenario for me personally because She's somewhere very far away, and and we all know that, you know, UN and the climate um, climate awareness campaigns that that UN has done so many years, and especially in 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 sustainability area, what we have to do is we have to collect research data, you know, uh, of of the outcomes of these meetings, but honestly, not not much, not systemic. There's there's no systemic change that happened before, but. When Greta Thunberg, um, you know, did something and then basically get the rally the support from everyone globally, it, it basically garnered support from all ages. You know, people from in, in sitting in the board of uh, directors of companies, uh, people in schools, uh, going down to, to to like climate change rallies on the street, and you have teenagers, the youth, and everyone else. So I think that that is the power of of youth, uh, youth voices as well. And then I think very grateful that we have movements like Undi 18 and also Abim Angkatan Belia to be present in, in, uh, in Malaysia, if not in the world, uh, to basically amplify these, these youth voices. 
Uh, and I think just just echoing to to my first point earlier, I saw the change happening in, in large corporations, which just to articulate the the impact from this is youth has no say or cloud of influence in large corporations actually, but be, but it's so amazing that how you know by uh, you know having a lot of resilience going down and just rallying about the same cause about you know what's going to happen to our future generations what's happen what's going to happen in the next 20 years to to this planet earth they have managed to create an impact in so many pockets of of uh, societies and communities uh, and, and especially the you know the people who are in power so i think that that is my personal view of, of uh, you know the power of youth in sustainability and also building a civilization Thank you so much, Chief Hafiz. I think that's that's really amazing. That's you know a very powerful point you know that he shared. You know even though uh, very seldom we see young people have a very significant role in large corporation, right? But how you know the Greta Thunberg effect can actually you know influence such big corporation as well at the end of the day, right? So I think I think the message is really you know as young people, how do we have that kind of confidence that we can make a change, right? So going back to the points that the panelists have made earlier, uh, I would like to address Chief Faisal. Um, so you talk about um, the challenges of polari polarization especially you know in, in, in terms of the use of social media right I mean in today's generation everybody is so exposed to everything online and there's so many things online so the question I have for you is how can young people come counter these or those challenges of polar polarization that they that they encounter in the social media how do they know whether those things that they are consuming in the social media are, are right or wrong you know, I mean, they are so, you know, they're so influenced by so many things online. So how do they develop that ability to be able to tell what is right and what is wrong? So, yeah. Okay, thank you uh, for the question. First of all, of course, I, will have, to, I, have, to, I have to make it clear. I am uh, strongly uh, support the freedom of expression or freedom of information. But of course, there are a lot of, you know, uh, uh, issue of uncertainties as stated by uh, drama because of this uh, unverified uh, news or information uh, fed uh, by the social media. And of course, I, I don't think uh, regulations per se, it is a solution, I mean, uh, to uh, reshape the mind of the young people in terms of uh, looking at the social media. But uh, uh, if I may share, uh, during conversation with uh, the old time media, you know, when we talk about the news being uh, fed to the newspaper at least you know uh, those times even though there are very restrictions in terms of license and so on but at least uh, the media editor they are responsible in terms of shaping the mind of the readers for example when they uh, put up or point out certain issues at the front page they make it clear at the second page on you know uh, how to shape the mind of the peop young people when they look at certain issues. Uh, for example, they bring um, opinions from the experts to give a comment and sometimes they uh, interview NGOs as well. But rather now, it is very total, a uh, different uh, arena of taking uh, news. Even uh, people or young people, uh, they always look at what uh, so-called the Clickbaity news as compared to the substance of the news itself. Okay, so uh, if you ask me uh, how to have this new, uh, uh, what we call uh, paradigm of looking at the social media, I think it is very important to have a dialogue, to to interact or to meet each other. And uh, just relying or secluded yourself, uh, consuming news uh, and sharing with your own communities. You have to be uh, inclusive in terms of give, give comment. Okay, for instance, um, if you look at the study case, uh, the people who are really pro with certain uh, ideology or maybe um, information uh, that being fed by, by them. If you look at their uh, data, I mean, uh, their profile of uh, social media, they are really homogeneous in terms of you know races or their own communities, so they don't uh, uh, think it is uh, irresponsible to give certain comments, criticizing others. So 
um, that's why sometimes when people say that social media is something that uh, can open the mind of the people, I, I think we have to recheck whether it is true or not because you know sometimes social media, even when you have Twitter, when you have uh, Facebook, you have to see uh, the profile of your Twitter or Facebook friends. Basically, those are really homogeneous. Uh, they don't think it is, you know, irresponsible to share certain untrue stories about others, uh, about refugees, about what, whatsoever issues that can uh, create conflicts. So, at the end of the day, it, it is very important, uh, instead of just consuming news from social media, let's having uh, like talk or even uh, have more engagement with the rest of the people. So, uh, looking at the news, looking at the uh, any information through social media must be based on uh, commentaries from your peers, multiracial peers, or even uh, multi-identity uh, friends, so that you can you know at least strike a balance uh, before you accept uh, certain news from the media. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, checking your who your people, your friends are, right? So anybody else would like to add on to that question and how do we? you know, uh, enable the young people to be able to distinguish between the right and wrong information in the social media so that they are not being influenced by it, you know, and, and causes a lot of polarization and, and, you know, and disunity, especially in our multi-ethnic society. I do think one of the big issues really, um, of course, I, I certainly agree with, uh, with uh, Sarah Faisal that, uh, that there's a lot of responsibility that also comes with the youth in terms of the stuff that we consume, in terms of how we practice, uh, and I think that comes to education. So I do think that um, in schools, for example, that there can be some exposure to um, to information literacy, to make sure that, uh, to media literacy, so that there is some level of critical thinking that, that happens over here. I do, think that, I do think that that's one of the factors, right? But on the other side, um, I think young people have also been one of the generations that have grown up with social media. And I think that also gives some level of understanding about what is fake and what is real, some level. So there is some level of a critical understanding about to be able to discern the differences, right? Um, so I think that, that part is, is somewhat balanced, or of course it can be improved. I do think that one of the biggest issues with social media is social media platforms themselves, right? Um, I think that there is a responsibility, and I do think that there will be a greater global conversation. Because I mean, we're talking about conversations on a global scale, right? Civilization, not just what does Malaysia think, but I do think on a global scale, there is bigger conversations going on is, uh, to is, uh, is social media algorithms and how things are being managed um, appropriate, right? The fact that you congregate certain, based on algorithms, people who, who believe in what you believe, say what you say and think what you think. That if, let's say, you like one thing, you're being, being linked to anti-vax content, you're being linked to uh, radical content, you're being linked to uh, anti-social content just because you're lacking one thing. I think these are very unhealthy uh, linkages that are being there and of course the, the challenge is that government uh, or actually most governments don't have the capacity and capability to identify and be able to, to create legislation that is appropriate to address these crises. You've seen in the US, right? Um, I, I'm not too sure if any of you have seen their congressional hearings on, um, on, on Facebook, on Google, and you could see how out of depth many of their leaders were, right? And uh, I mean, I, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to comment about Malaysian leadership, but I do think that this is the issue right, where many of our leaders and global leaders are from a different generation, right? Those who are 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, 90 years old, and you want them to legislate and give input on something that they, they don't even use, right? They just say to their social media manager, please, help me post this, I uh, that's all. You know, that, so how can you have legislation like that? So I do think that the, the, the conversation should not be based on government legislation. I think that's a, I think one is a slippery slope, but number two, I don't think we have the tools necessary, but it should be a pressure, a global regional pressure towards social media organizations to better regulate, self-regulate, and most importantly, to make sure that they have a moral responsibility in terms of how they manage their own social media. I do think that a big part of this information is that it's not that you are deliberately going into misinformation, that you are nudged into it naturally. That you are creating, that you have created artificial bubbles based on your own algorithms. Uh, that is not your fault, 
it is the fault of the social media platforms. I think that's one of the big issues that we have. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm glad you mentioned those in the 50s, 60s, because I'm not in that category. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hafiz, do you have anything to add on to that? Yeah, just, just a bit on, on the points that were shared uh, by the two gentlemen here. Um, I think, like what Rama said, the, and, and what I've observed in, the, in schools today, primary schools and also secondary schools, they are actually very much okay with consuming uh, social media contents and using gadgets to, to basically learn from uh, YouTube and different other learning platforms. Because they grew up with it, that is their, their mass media platforms, right? Compared to, and I think what, what I'm worried about is the, the earlier generations, i.e. their teachers, the school principals and all that, they are the ones who actually show more uh, deviation to other areas. So, so like polarization, uh, <clears throat> like anti-vax and, and pro-vaccine. You can see that clearly among the teachers in schools. Yeah, actually they are the ones that you don't really see murid-murid have anti-vaxxers, you know. They, they can't be bothered. They, they, are, they consume social media and, and, and this um, digital platform for entertainment and also for, for learning. And I think it's really good to see an, a big influx of uh, content creators who contributed educational materials during the past, like the past two years. Because actually a lot of students learn through YouTube videos and these videos can come from India or like Philippines about like you know mathematics uh, or any other subjects actually. So actually it, it contributed to, to reduce the, the gap of like learning loss the past two years. So I'm actually quite quite happy to have to see uh, how this new generation using uh, the digital platforms to learn and, and all that. The oops sorry. <laughs> one of the disadvantages of yeah so uh, yeah but I think that based on my personal observation when, when, when we go down to schools it's, it's the understanding of uh, and the polarization among the teachers consuming fake news or, or what not is, is something that we oh okay interesting this take good things something like that yeah but I'm not pointing fingers it's just an observation of, of a few schools uh, but yeah I think like to what Tarma shared earlier uh, legislation and, and I think self-regulation not only in a local context but regional and also globally which also maybe involve uh, influencing Elon Musk on how he controls Twitter yeah I think should 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 be done yeah thank you thank you so much I think this is a very important you know topic that we talk about and uh, you know our panelists have actually given us a lot of very important insights that a lot of adults parents, teachers are very concerned about how do we regulate our young people, make, making sure you know that they are on the social media but making sure they are consuming the right things. But apparently it is, it is not just the young people that we should be worried about, even the parents themselves or teachers, we need to be worried about ourselves as well. You know, so so I think that's that's a wonderful point that you have shared. Thank you so much. Now I would like to address again the second question, or oh, sorry, the second point that uh, Tama has shared earlier. Uh, he talks about the, 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 the main crisis that we are experiencing today is not just... Sorry. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. So the crisis that we are experiencing today is just not the crisis of you know, climate change you know, or economic crisis, but it's the crisis of uncertainty. So again, um, I, I would like to ask you know, the question to the panel, um, how do we then overcome this sense of uncertainty? I mean, the world is really uncertain. I don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Uh, we don't even know what's the direction of the Ukrainian and Russian war is leading the world to. And we are not even sure how this COVID pandemic is going to turn out. You know, before the end of COVID pandemic, now we are hearing the next thing coming up, that is the monkeypox. So, I mean, it's just filled with uncertainty. So how do we address this uncertainty, especially among the young people who actually experiences the greatest impact? Because we can tell this from actually the numbers of those having a mental uh, problem, especially post pandemic, you know, they are really, really affected by that. So how, how do we overcome this sense of uncertainty, especially among the young people? So Tama, you wanna go first? Yeah. My answer to uncertainty is action. I think the if you feel that the world is an uncertain place to be in, which is true, 
right? There's so much of things that you cannot control, so much of things that is outside of your realm of power. Then the, the what you need to do is to rebuild and regain some sense of control and some sense of power. I think that's one of the important things that I want to emphasize. Uh, but what does this even mean, right? When it says take back power and take action, it's a very big idea. What I believe is that each of you over here, young people, uh, middle-aged people, older people, all of us have a sense of ability of our sphere of influence and control. What can we do in our lives to make things better for things around us? What can we do to advocate for change? But also, I think very importantly is that we have to stop delegating and giving away our power to other people. Right? I think that's something that's very important. For far too long, I've, I, I believe that, you know, like for example, you look at the process of politics and democracy. Our idea of politics and democracy is that let's just vote once every five years. Okay, I already chosen my leader, my MP, my Adun. Okay, you guys just do whatever it is you want. I will just do my job, I will just relax. Next year, five years time, I'll go and vote again, right? I'm not saying that elections are bad. I'm a big believer in democracy. That's why we did Undi 18 and we fought for the right to vote. But I want to also emphasize this, that democracy only begins with the ballot box. The process of democracy must continue throughout your life continue throughout your year and continue throughout your days. That's how you build a better nation together. So I think that's the question that we all have to ask because often we've just delegated parts of our life to other people to control, whether it is economy, whether it is uh, our own social movement, and whether it's our own voice. So I do think that it's time for us to regain it in order to be able to address this uncertainty. Because again, I want to share over here that uncertainty fundamentally happens because you cannot have the ability to even chart your way forward. You don't know what is your future. And of course, there are many global economic issues that are playing a part that makes it difficult. But there are many local issues that you should be able to control that you can make better. right? Uh, for example, if let's say there's issues of food security. How do we then make sure that we, have, we don't have only cash crops, like for example, palm oil, and we also have more food sustainability and also food security related crops? For example, you, you can see the, the rise in, uh, in chicken prices recently, right? It's because we are entirely reliant on other countries to get our corn, to get our wheat, which is the food that we use to give our chickens. So even though we have a decent uh, chicken industry, but we don't have that basic thing. And there are many elements, our rice is 60% imported from other countries. These are all real issues that we can address based on public policy based on our own national consciousness. But the question that we all have to ask is that, we have our sphere of influence, right? What are we doing? And that was the question that I asked back in 2016, 2017, when we started OB18, and we realized, you know what? I was an engineer working then. Um, so I was a full-time engineer, and I realized, you know what? I, I want to try to do more for my country. So let's try this out, let's try this movement. And here we are today, with 500 million new voters, you know, with a completely changed uh, democratic ecosystem. So I believe that everyone over here, uh, if there are people who, who will watch this video later, I'm not sure, I don't think you're doing a live stream, right? Yeah, but I think the idea is this. That it's live. It is live, okay, all right. I think the idea is this, that each of us has ability, each of us are intelligent, each of us are capable, each of us are, have a voice. How do we leverage that for change? So I think that's my answer. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, Jipaisa? Yeah, just, my, just a brief. Okay. Um, if you ask me, uh, the issue of, of uncertainty uh, begins from the city. When we talk about the issues, you know, keep changing. Uh, for example, in Malaysia, we have political conflicts, we have a uh, climate crisis issue, uh, like uh, major floods. We have um, so many issues keep changing. It happens in the city, but we tend to forget what happens. I mean, uh, among the village folks, for example, and that's why. Uh, through the discussion, even I've been with our state leaders, you know, we found out that there are a lot of more sustain, sustainable issues that we tend to forget, uh, I mean, uh, at the grassroots, I mean, uh, among the village folk and so on. And if we just focusing on uh, the issues uh, in the city, uh, as, as I said, you know, when, when the issues keep changing, when there are one issues, we just uh, uh, start to have a conversation on one particular issue and then uh, all of a sudden we have another issues that we need to face. So it, it is uh, that kind of issue that happened uh, in the city and if we tend to forget 
uh, I mean, the more sustainable issues among the village folks, for example, uh, economic issues, they always being there uh, among the Kelantanese or in, among the uh, rural areas and so on. There are a lot of issues that uh, I could say uh, need to be uh, taken into consideration as compared to the issue in the city. So at least we know uh, or we give empowerment to them to deal with, the, with that particular issue. And that's why, if I may share as well, uh, we have uh, our, our vice president now working with Change Org. It is a petition on it is a kind of empowerment. How to empower the uh, the young people, especially the youth, uh, at the rural area, to amplify their issues as compared to uh, you know we just give limelight to the issues that happen in the city. Uh, and that's why we always believe in this kind of uncertainty. And and if we talk about uncertainty in politics, it also happen in terms of you know where we keep changing the government and, and that's why yeah if you can see politicians nowadays when they are in the government those people when they are in, in the government they, they have to grab everything on the table because they are afraid of being you know uh uh uh, 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 uh because the generation is just around the corner so uncertainty happens and last but not least if you read the books of pankaj mishra the age of anger this contributes, uncertainties contributes to the anger of the people. People always want to talk about change, want to talk about uh, whatsoever uh, reform that they want because of anger, because they are uncertain. They don't know what happened next. At least, previously in Malaysia, we have our own vision. I'm not pro to them, but, but, but at least we know the direction of the country, uh, vision 2020. But now, even the current Prime Minister also cannot guarantee that he will sustain to be PM. That's why I don't think he will be able to have the vision for Malaysia, for example. So this is issue of uncertainty that happens. But at the end of the day, for us, how to overcome the issue of uncertainty? Let's go back to the grassroots, empower the grassroots, and keep focusing on the grassroots, the village folks. They have more sustainable issues. Uh, they have, uh, if, even if we counter issues faced by them, uh, as I said, unemployment. So they can live happily and they know the directions of their uh, way of life for the future as compared to us who live in the city. Thank you, thank you so much Faisal for that. Uh, have you said anything else to add on to that? Uh, maybe a short one before we move on to the next question. Yeah, yeah I think I think just echoing uh, the two speakers earlier, uh, to, to overcome uncertainties, it's actually um, one of the things that we inculcate in TFM is, is leadership, and I think what Tarma you know started his speech with the, the how to address is through action, and I think with leadership when you inculcate leadership, you are at least you are able to control your ecosystem, your own ecosystem, be it small or big. So in, in TFM, we are not just a, a a platform where we recruit and send teachers to rural schools. Lah. Actually, our I was sharing with Prof. Raida earlier, our bread and butter is a leadership framework or, or platform. It is, it's a leadership pathway that you go through to transform yourselves. And and under our theory of leadership, there's lead self, lead others and lead change, which I feel like is very critical in our education ecosystem because when I, I have conversations with Cheku Cheku or like the teachers in the classrooms, when I, and, and I think Prof. Zoraida was, was sharing with me earlier what is a leader to you, and they don't see themselves as a leader, this Cheku Cheku. They see their principal or Guru Besar as a leader. When actually, for, for us, with our theory of leadership, the students, all the way to the teachers, uh, Ketua Panitia, GPKM, all, all levels, have a leadership role to play. And what that means is you are actually, you have the power to take action. And, and I think this, this small steps or this, this uh, microscopic view of how, like, you know, what is your role as a leader, what kind of actions you, you can take would actually uh, help to address, um, you know, this, this space of uncertainty. Because if, if like, like what Tarma shared earlier, I've already voted this, this, and then in this space of five years, let's just sit back and relax and see what the politicians can do. 
and then you know we if we hate something we just finger point them or the majlis perbandaran or you know clock rules or what not so but actually if we ask ourselves hey actually i have a role that i can do you know i have a role to play i can either vote or i can do whatever i can within my capacity as a, as a you know this or say like small pockets of leadership that i have so yeah that that's that's my answers Thank you. Thank you so much for these amazing, you know, uh, answers from our panelists. So what I gather for, from from our panel panelists is really, you know, given the times are so uncertain and nobody can tell what's going to happen tomorrow. But what's important is, you know, we need to be inclusive in terms of our actions. It has to be inclusive. You know, we have we have to look into a very holistic approach when we do th these things, and we need to um, empower the people in the grassroots, especially. And everything starts from taking action oneself, you know, rather than waiting for somebody who is going to do it for me. But what about myself, right? So starting from taking action from oneself. So it's really the, 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 the argument about believing in yourself that each and every one of us have this potential that we are leaders in our own community and we ourselves can make a change, right? Thank you so much for these wonderful answers. So now I would like to go to the next uh, session of our discussion. Um, I will have specific questions uh, for each panel, uh, uh, especially uh, with regards to uh, the organization that you represent. So I would like to have um, more specific questions. So perhaps I'll start with uh, Chick Faisal. Okay, so Chick Faisal, he's a representative from uh, ABIM. So my question is, what is the role of religious education, perhaps Islam specifically and in your context, in supporting the development of youth awareness to a sustainability in a plural society? Alright, uh, when we talk about the dialogue, now we have civilization and dialogue center. Of course, in, in, in Islam or in Quran, Allah narrates a lot of dialogues by prophets, not only Prophet Muhammad, but those prophets before Muhammad SAW with their own communities. For example, Allah asked Prophet Musa or Moses to have dialogue with Pharaoh at the early stage of da'wah or uh, uh, preaching about uh, I mean about God. And, and also Prophet Musa, Prophet, Prophet Musa uh, he was asked to have a dialogue with the people of scriptures, Ahlul, Ahlul Kitab. Uh, in, in Quran, uh, Allah said, قُلْ يَا أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ تَعَلَّوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَىٰ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Allah said, to Prophet Muhammad, Allah said to Prophet Muhammad, say to people of scriptures that have the common words between us and between you. So this is very important when we talk about a dialogue, when we, when, when we talk about a conversation. Because in Islam, it is very important. And of course, when we talk about uh, Islamic or Muslim roles in terms of dialogue, it is not just about conceptual, but more on practical side. If I may share, uh, for example, uh, the hijrah, the migration, when Prophet Muhammad SAW initiated movement to migrate from Mekah to Madinah, it is not just about migration from persecution, but it is about how to shift the mind of Arab peoples to have more in terms of appreciating the plural society. You know, when uh, this period of, I, I think you know, about infanticide, the killing people, heavy atrocities by the, uh, the mushrikin uh, in Mekah, there, there were a lot of conflicts in terms of society. Um, I mean, uh, there, are, there are a lot of negative things. So that's the reason why Prophet Muhammad SAW initiate movement to have a migration, to, to migrate to Madina. And when Prophet Muhammad uh, he migrated to Madina, it is a practical way of, you know, having uh, conversation, interactions and dialogue. When Prophet Muhammad SAW initiate uh, migration or migrate to Madina, he established one particular state, the state of Madina. Even he changed the name of Madinah, previously known as Yathrib. Madinah means city. Uh, so he shifted the mind, the mentality of the Arab people to become more civilized people. Uh, and then uh, he enacted the Madinah constitution, appreciating the Jews and Christians uh, uh, and also Muslims uh, to be part of you know, the citizens of Madinah. So this is very important when, when I talk about the Muslim role in unifying uh, or in establishing civilization in plural society. Those time before uh, migration, Arab people they don't have this kind of you know uh, the open-minded, uh, the 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 talk of uh, openness, inclusiveness. Uh, but Prophet Muhammad SAW, when he migrated to Madinah, he shaped the mind of the Arab people to be more inclusive, to appreciate differences. 
uh, and to share expertise. At the end of the day, when we talk about civilization, it is not just about one particular race, but it is about how to share prosperity, how to share common interests among human beings, to develop human beings. It, it is not just about um, one particular religion or race. And this practical side of the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, when he managed to establish one state of Marina, he shaped the idea of uh, openness, inclusivity among the Arab peoples itself as a profound basis of the civilization. And after you know, after the death of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, we can see the huge civilization in Spain, in Syria, even in Baghdad, it comes from or it derived from the act of Prophet Muhammad Sallam when he managed to shape in a practical way, the idea or um, they have to have more uh, dialogue or interactions um, with the community. So, all in all, when we talk about um, differences, of course, as I said, we appreciate differences, but uh, in Islam, uh, Allah always teaches us to be uh, more inclusive in terms of finding common grounds, even as I say in uh, what was in the Quran, uh, even. Um, when we talk about interactions, when we talk about uh, find uh, what can uh, I mean be done in terms of uh, having more uh, in terms of developing human beings, it is very important. And of course, looking at the uh, current scenario uh, today, we as an NGO, uh, a been and also with other NGOs as well, it is very important to have more dialogue like uh, program that we have currently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faisal, for that. Yeah, I think the, the, the crux of this, the crux of it eventually is really uh, to have dialogue. You know, to really, because it is only through such dialogue that you talk about, and you give a very good example, you know, of in, in the case of Medina, that it really shows that kind of inclusivity, and it really shows the importance of having dialogue to really embrace and respect those differences, but we can still live together based on, you know, uh, the common words and the shared prosperity and the shared values. So thank you so much for that. Now, I would like to... Uh, um, the, uh, pass the next question to Mr. Tama. Um, so... Being the founder of uh, Undi Lapanglas, besides demanding for good governance, that is obvious, right? What is the role of Undi Lapanglas in advocating for a better civilization amongst the diverse population in this country? And will developing a sustainable future for the youth be one of Undi Lapanglas' agenda? All right, uh, thank you. Um, I think two ways to answer that question. Uh, one is in terms of sustainability. For us, we are, we are more than just a movement of uh, fighting for good governance, we are a movement fighting for the future, a better future for all. And there cannot be a future without nature. right? So I think um, because of that, we, we started something called My Hutan. So My Hutan is a, is a campaign, uh, is a movement to ensure that there is climate-centric uh, policies that are being advocated and, uh, and instilled into our laws and instilled into our constitution to ensure that there is less deforestation, there is less flooding, uh, we have uh, a proper climate change act. I think these are key elements and key things that we are advocating for. In fact, just over this weekend, we just had the, uh, the Mai Hutan Summit and the National Youth Climate Consultation. We just uh, finished over that. And the idea is that we've brought together a room of young people from uh, Mahasiswa University, uh, from youth organizations, from NGOs, from political parties, can we then come together and say that this is what youth want in terms of climate, um, you know, uh, climate policy, so that at the very least from the Malaysian perspective, we are advocating for something clear. So I think that's one thing that we are working for because I think we cannot run away from the conversation of climate. The second thing is in regards to, uh, I think it's a bit more of a complex question, right? How do we develop a, um, you know, uh, how do we develop unity or, uh, or racial harmony? And, and again, I think it's very easy to put those ideas that we are all united, uh, quote unquote, or that we are all uh, together. But, but in the end, if we don't have something, a platform that unifies us, then what we prioritize is that which differentiates us. This is the reality of human human existence, right? If let's say there's nothing that we can have a commonality, we focus on our differences. So what we are trying to do at the moment is to try to develop a movement, and we have a movement called Uni Negaraku, 
where we build based on state by state uh, outreach towards youth, and we try to build and we try to spread the idea uh, using the Rukun Negara as a core element of our national identity. And I just want to emphasize, right, something that people often overlook. When we look, when we talk about the Rukun Negara, we always talk about the five principles Rukun Negara. You know, kepercayaan kepada Tuhan, keluaran perbagaan, dan sebagainya, right? But we never think about what are those principles serving. Buat apa ada prinsip, tapi tujuan dia tak tahu. And that's why people often overlook the first part of the Rukun Negara, which is the objective Rukun Negara. You can all Google what is the objective Rukun Negara, right? Which is something which is related to membina masyarakat demokratik, to have a progressive society in terms of uh, in terms of uh, our approach to science and uh, and technology, to be able to build a society that is uh, that is in favor of justice, to build a society that is diverse, that is embracing of uh, of differences. These are things that are in our Rukun Negara that was built. 50 years ago, yet we are not embracing that and we are asking ourselves who are we as Malaysians, what do we want, what, how do we define ourselves. When I think that we can say, you know, if we are effective you know, in using this idea, we can say that a Malaysian or, or the Malaysian dream is to be able to, to achieve, um, to, to be able to fight for justice, for democracy, for progress, for fairness. I think these are things that are you know that these are very core ideas, very in interesting ideas of what it means to be a Malaysian. So if we can fight for this as a means of our unity, of our similarity, then perhaps we can at least we can uh, we can ignore a little bit that which different uh, that that uh, that divides us, right? We can look at things that divide us as a flavor instead of a real contention or as a real divisive factor. So I think that's the that's the key thing that we're working on. Of course, it's easier said than done, right? Um, you know, of course, we, we as an organization, we're still very small uh, and our, our network is still quite limited. But I do think that this project of developing uh, a national um, identity or at least a platform of similarity is something that we must advocate for together. Um, and I hope more young people try to figure out, I try to ask this question, what can unite us instead of just what is dividing us and what makes us annoyed about each other? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think if you were to ask uh, the young people what unites us, perhaps the answer would be food, right? Uh -huh. um, durian or nasi lemak or Twitter, you know, or Insta, whatever. So yeah, have you you have anything? Oh yeah, sorry, I'm supposed to ask you the whole question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Right, for Hafiz, yes, uh, he's in an NGO, like I said, that is very close to my heart, I Teach for Malaysia. So is a million dollar question, Hafiz? Yeah, so my question is, is there a missing puzzle related to promoting the development of a great civilization and the importance of achieving SDG in our current education system? If yes, what are your recommendations or suggestions to mitigate the problem so that our school curriculum supports development of a civilization that focuses on core assistance and sustainable development. Okay, thank you for the question. The question is a bit long. And, and I think when you touch on civilization, I was just saying to Dr. Wendy earlier, it's, it's actually a very big umbrella of things and a lot of subjects fall under uh, you know, a great civilization. Um, <clears throat> so, in TFM, actually, like, like I was mentioning, we have a, the theory of leadership, and I think our our um, philosophy that that we, we always hold on to is very much aligned to the falsafah uh, pendidikan kebangsaan, a national education philosophy, which is to create a holistic individual, um, and and that can coexist in a, in a very harmonious um, environment uh, and that is our, our classroom currently. So the, the term holistic individual to us, how we want to achieve that is by inculcating the, the theory of leadership because we believe that <coughs> education shouldn't be limited to just achieving good grades you know, uh, what are your scores, what are, what are the teachers' KPI only because we, we believe that in, when, when we spend time with the students in the classroom we are actually building and creating like agents of change or we are building the leaders of tomorrow so it's very much beyond 
what is the subject, the, what is what is the the grade that these students score today. So grades are very very uh, essential indicators of how well what what are their learning gains and what not, which we use as short term measures. But our long term goals of our presence in in the school is to make sure that that we calculate a holistic um, development of of each student. Yeah. So I think. Uh, that that is the, the first answer. I think just just focusing on, on holistic development of a student and, and providing holistic education because our our vision is also one day all children in Malaysia has equal access to quality education and and quality education. I think that that is um, that basically sets the guideline for whatever whatever program that we do. We need to make sure that. The, the quality education that we offer reaches out to uh, children regardless, regardless of race, background, level of income, uh, geographical conditions and geographical location. Yeah, so that's number one. Number two is, <coughs> I think, um, in terms of incorporating ESG in, in, in uh, civilization or basically in our future generation, what we have been doing is uh, incorporating sustainability and, and education. So ESG obviously uh, you know uh, encompasses uh, environment, so social, and governance. The study that we've done internally for for TFM is we are very high on on uh, social and governance, but not so high in, in environment. <coughs> so that's why uh, organisations like you know My Hutan just making sure that there is policies and, and making sure uh, yeah, policies at national level promoting environmental action is, is very critical so that whenever we teach students in, in classrooms about um, kesejahteraan alam, you know, the importance of taking care of, of mother nature and all that and when they leave, they have platforms to continue that because what we see is there's a lot of initiative being done in classrooms primary and secondary but after that, in university is either like you're you're or you know you're on your own to to continue whatever um, subjects that you learn. Um, and I think like what I what I shared earlier, based on my observation in in today's um, generation, i.e., primary and school, uh, secondary school students, their level of awareness in terms of environmental actions is very high. In fact, if you I mean, for us and, and for our school system, we like to to introduce programs like Kita Smula and all that. But I can already see them asking bigger questions like, what's going to happen to to the world or to basically this district if we keep on if we keep on uh, throwing rubbish everywhere? And in fact, I think their awareness is high because. They are already starting to see the impact of climate uh, climate change or climate disasters, like number one, Banjir flood. Yeah, when I visited the schools and I, I, I got the chance to to just speak to some of the students who who experienced a lot of loss at home and also at schools, they say that you know this this really has to stop, and they are the ones who actually went on the ground help their, their community, help their teachers and the schools to to basically rebuild their lives after the the December um, you know massive flood that happened particularly in, in Klang Valley and then uh, yeah Klang Slango areas. So so I think their awareness is very high uh, because they are already starting to see the impact already. Uh, but the question is how do we give them you know power and how do we give them a platform to, to create changes and, and basically to do uh, all these things and yes we can I think yes the government can introduce different different programs but I think we need to also give them room some room to for, for their creativity yeah because the youth and you know the, the young generation has a lot an immense level of creativity in the types of things that they can come up with innovations to basically make the world a, a better place. So yeah, so these are the two big pointers that I would like to share. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, that, that gives really gives us a lot of hope. <coughs>
now that, that the young ones are actually aware of what's happening around them. You know, it's just that whether the question is whether do we provide enough platform for them to actually you know exercise their rights and you know demonstrate their creativity and how do they continue you know uh, doing what they believe in you know uh, even up upon graduation. So I think that these are some of these very interesting uh, you know feedbacks that we receive from the panel. So now I guess uh, we can actually open to the floor. So uh, we'd like to. Uh, uh, request if there's anyone from the floor who would like to ask questions to our panelists. I'm, I'm very sure they are very happy to receive your question. So please indicate your name and uh, the organization you represent, and you can also indicate your question uh, who do you want to direct a question to to which panelists. Okay, so now the floor is open. Yes, Dr. Zhu? I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Wendy, I think, uh, but when you talk about environmental movement, uh, which is my major, so I'll call <laughs> for to ask, to ask the question. So I will, I will start about the ball rolling, I Please, guess. Uh, I think later on you can ask too. Uh, recently, if you realise that all the young people, they don't really like structure. It's the age of deglobalization, deregulation. And recently I was invited to a talk which was organized by a group of students in UM which is not a registered entity so they call themselves the Planet Prodigy so when I, I went there so I thought it was like a normal club like uh, normally we are being invited to talk about climate action and role of youth but then when I asked uh, who's your president oh doctor we don't have any president it's a very organic structure where everybody do their job and I said, oh, so how, how do you get your funding? I mean, they rented out uh, one cafe, he and she cafe in the 12th uh, college, yes. and, and just just do it. And so they would like to hear more about the role of youth in climate action. So they would like to invite me. So they just invite me di directly without, uh, and I ask, uh, do you have any advisor? So they said, no, no advisor. So we are just a, a group of young people, students, who are interested to hear or interested to know more about climate action and how uh, we can contribute towards it and so we just get together we did some crowdsourcing and uh, we do this uh, event and the event was was really a success a lot of people turning out on a saturday morning okay anyway so uh, i would like to ask i think you, you guys already mentioned that this might be the due i think mr tama mentioned the lack of cloud of influence among youth in, in bigger institutions, even even in UM itself. Maybe it's time for us to hear from them more, like I think uh, Dish for Malaysia is doing, right? Because everything is being asked for. I mean, you should do this, you should do that. But rather than, you know, bottom up. So, uh, But these young people, uh, they don't care. They just they just do whatever they want to do and they keep on moving with all the their energy, you know, you see? So I would like to ask the panelists, any of you, whether this trend of uh, not being involved in main, mainstream uh, platforms like, like you guys are heading, is it is it a good one or should we encourage them or should we empower them to use the existing platform or, you know, uh, go mainstream? That is one question. And then uh, the other issue is that uh, when they have a lot of energy, uh, they could be channeled to to the wrong direction to be to be anti-establishment, not uh, participating in a democratic process because they don't believe in it. Because like what Mr. Tango mentioned just now, it's a five years uh, event. You vote, and then you let them do whatever they want, and they are doing. And then the 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 one that are elected are doing what they want so so they just oh we don't care about this so we don't even want to participate because uh unheard voices right so should we encourage this or should we educate the young to participate in democratic process so okay thank you so much dr zo so who wants to take the question first uh, yeah okay. I mean, i'll take i'll be able to answer uh, both i'll take a step uh, um, I think the first thing is that in terms of how movements have started nowadays, right? I think it's just because there have been different platforms and different opportunities where you don't need a persatuan or to be a registered entity anymore to have a voice. 
right? Because of social media, you're able to then achieve it. Like for example, even Undi 18, we started off as hashtag, right? Hashtag Undi 18, right? And then of course, we built from there. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of successful organizations who have just started as a decentralized, you know, just a, a non-official organization, uh, and they've been able to achieve some level of success. However, I do want to mention this, right? Uh, especially for those who might be watching, uh, while the barrier to entry has never been lower, but there must always be a question of what you want to achieve. I think that's a real big question that I've seen a lot where a lot of people feel like, okay, I have a voice and therefore I'm able to speak up on certain issues. And sometimes, you know, people, people like my content, people come to my, to come to my events. But then the question is this, what greater impact am I having aside from awareness? Because when it comes to theory of change, Awareness is only the, the, the first part in your theory of change, right? Uh, I mean, if anyone is familiar with that, so there's many, many other layers all up to the actual change process, right? So how do you get from that awareness to that actual change process? And that's the part that, I'm, you know, that we're trying to educate. So when we do our programs with Undi 18, uh, and we have a lot of programs, we try to educate them on how do we get from that awareness level all the way from that legislation and change level, which I think is missing over here. Right, because uh, I mean, I think it's great that many young people are, are wanting to do Instagram pages on environmentalism, on feminism, on refugee rights. It's great, right? But please don't stop there. Please engage in policy makers. Please, you know, engage with society. Please do more than that, right? Because again, um, there's so much opportunity out there. It's, it feels like a waste that people's energies are just wasted on just the awareness part. And that's, that's, that's one, right? And perhaps. Maybe that's where the intervention can come in. You can educate them that what you're doing is good, but there's so much more you can do. Whether or not you choose to register as a, as a Prasatwan is up to you, but there's so much more that you can actually do. This is how you can do it. I think that's, that part is important. Uh, number two, the, the, the question of... Uh, so what was the second question again? Uh, if you don't mind, just... Anti-establishment. Anti-establishment, right. Um, yeah, I, I mean, for me, I think... Uh, I'll have to be quite honest, lah, right? Sometimes there is value in trying to, in, in, uh, in being slightly anti-establishment, anti right? I know it's a bit controversial to say, right? But the question that we often have to ask is that what is an acceptable, acceptable realm of this cause? Because we cannot assume that establishment is always correct. Because we've seen in many cases, in many countries, where very bad people, for example, you look at Philippines right now, uh, Philippines in the past, Duterte took over. Now Marcos Jr. is still taking over. Can we really say that just because they are establishment, therefore they are morally correct. That's not necessarily true, right? But the question was asked that what is acceptable? Should we go to violence? Should we go to, you know, to terrorism, that kind of stuff? Of course not, right? So, but there is an acceptable range of things that, for example, we can speak up, we can challenge, we can file, a, we can go, a, go and file a lawsuit in court, we can maybe go and protest. I think these are, these are things that are, or do a peaceful protest. These are things that are acceptable. Uh, levels of uh, perhaps, I guess, so-called anti-establishment in a way, right? So I do think that that is something that is a conversation that should happen, but I do want to emphasize this, this thing, right? That we cannot simply just educate, right? And we can tell them via words. We as, you know, people who are slightly older, people who are, you know, who are slightly more experienced, we must show that this is a path or this is, a, this is an example that they can follow. Um, I think one, I think for us, like when we started with the 18, there's many other groups who are like, oh, these guys have managed to make that change, let me also try to, to copy and follow in the footsteps of the 18. So I think that's a good thing, right? But in your field, in your realm, what are things that you can do and you can lead and you can prove to other people and therefore they can use you as a model for them to learn from and follow? I think that's the important part. Because often when we, when we talk about education, it's always words. But I think what's more important is action so that people can follow as a real example and follow your real model for them to, uh, to model their behavior on. I think that's, that's, that's perhaps one way to address this disillusionment and this, this, this I, like, I don't want to be a part of democracy kind of, kind of feeling, right? To show that through action, how change can happen. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel would like to add on? Yeah. Yes, we cannot deny the fact that now uh, when, we, when we talk about championing awareness, now it derived from unstructured movement. For example, in our political uh, situation, you know, the reason perhaps, uh, the reason behind why it doesn't why they were thrown out, because of the movement, Kerajaan Gagal, uh, the hashtag of Kerajaan Gagal, and 
there was no leader of Pujan Gagan. It was a movement by leaderless people or leaderless community. Um, and and um, the same goes to if if you if you talk about the you know uh, the issue of bread and butter, about the issue of future generations, even um, uh, when people always talk about the social mobility, where we where we wish to empower the community, for example, in terms of social mobility. Now it is very different type of game. Previously, you know, when government wish to you know improve this our issue of social mobility, government just set up industries and then when after they graduate, they can be a lawyer, doctors and so on. But now they be a grab uh, driver and so on. So there are a lot of uh, changes, I mean, in terms of many things. So unstructured uh, movement or unstructured institution exists nowadays. But uh, bear in mind, if you ask me as, a, as an organization leader, we uh, look forward for the sustainability issues. How can you sustain when you are not structured in terms of, you know, uh, uh, spreading awareness and so on. So at the end of the day, you have to be registered. You have, to, for example, if you wish to get fund from the government or even from uh, any international uh, organizations, you have to be registered. And in terms of uh, ensuring that your uh, whatever legacy or I mean your efforts being uh, continued by your generations, you have to be structured. At the end of the day. Have you said anything to add? Uh, very interesting question uh, and I think just echoing the two speakers point I, I think from a senior leadership perspective of, of an NGO one of the things that we, we always uh, bear in mind is balance I think the keyword is balance uh. yes you shouldn't be too structured but it shouldn't also limit the creativity and, and the, the ability of people from your staff you know, from top, all, from bottom all the way to the top, to basically voice out their opinions, so that we can celebrate, you know, each other's opinions. But <clears throat> honestly speaking, we are in the age of there's a lot of uh, activism going on, and in Twitter language, there's also this woke culture. Yeah. <laughs> so I think leading to 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 Tarma's point on theory of change. A lot of the work culture activists still reside in the awareness sphere. You you call it out. You say you, you neck about something. Oh, you know this 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 system dot dot dot. You know, and and many of the many of the runs about a particular system or a person. But what are the actions are you taking? So without action, the still the the problem will still remain the same. You're basically not contributing to to the transition between problem to, to solution, or you know, basically solving that problem. And and I think um, you can see in, in Facebook there's there's like this this organization who goes around and and covering potholes or men <laughs> potholes. I think that's a very you know inspiring thing to do rather than you know just talk or or tweet. They just go and then any anyone who finds potholes they can. Uh, they will just take action now. Yeah, so so I think I'm coming from a point on always striking a balance uh, because like what uh, Senator Faisal said just now, organizational sustainability is a factor that they really have to, have to consider. Right now, at, at the inception or initial stage, uh, it can be, you know, there's a lot of like fire of activism or spirit of activism there because you need to, to really establish a voice so that you will be heard. Without that, you won't be heard by by either like critical mass or something, right? But along the way, to get funding in, in two, three, four, five to ten years time, there needs to be some structure or order in place for you to be a bit more established. But without forgetting the reason of your existence, yeah. Thank you so much. You know. Thank you so much, Zul, for asking that wonderful question. You know, I think this is just now the question I asked Hafiz. If that's the $1 million question, this will be the $2 million question. <laughs> because, you know, we are actually speaking to this these three very distinguished speakers, and they are the ones, they are the young people, number one. And number two, they have started their own NGOs. They are in an NGO, so they, they are actually giving us advice. You know, so listening to them is like I... I 
as though I was like look, looking at three seafoods here. Mm -hmm. You know, like how do we as young people, how do we run? You know, how do we start something we believe in, and not just at the stage of awareness, but how do we go to the next step of really taking action, right? So thank you so much for that invaluable, you know, input, you know, for from the people who are actually on the ground, right? So uh, can we have another question from the floor? Yes, yes, please. Yes, yes, okay. Hello, okay. Yes. Uh, I think I'm the eldest person in the hall. <laughs> <laughs> Young at heart, I'm just small. Okay, uh, so uh, it's really. Uh, I'm I'm really happy to hear uh, the young ones speaking out and they are leading their own crew. Uh, but what for me and I think my generation, I'm already 61. Okay, I'll just come on and say, uh, what what worries us is that we like to see all the young ones uh, getting involved either in a very systematic organization or the the ones that. What Dr. Zul has mentioned, because I also know some a few others. For example, Nyawa, Nyawa is also I don't know if you are you know, know about this one. They they work along the mental health issues. There is a group of people, five or six at the beginning, and now they're quite um, structured. But I think you must have the non-structured one must have have linkages, parents or uncles or whoever who can help them with the money. So that's how they survive for a while. Okay, my real question is that uh, the interaction of youth uh, in the whatever is happening in the government, etc. Now, in th there's so many opportunities. How do we quicken or hasten their maturity of interaction? Because right now, as you have said, I mean, even only 18, uh, the way we see it, yes, there are some of the above 18 year old people who are really mature, etc. But I'm sorry to say this, but I think there's a lot out there who's actually in that group of fast food generation. We, the, the elderly, call this group as fast food generation. We have children of their ages where they want things very fast. So who can give them the money to go to Burger King or KFC or whatever you have? They will love those people. And, and so this next few years, I think there will be a lot of adjustment that needs to be done in Malaysia. So how do you people like you all help in, in hastening, quickening the maturity of the youth? That's my question. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. I'll, I'll call that a three million question. Then. <laughs> yeah, I think that the point about instant gratification yeah. really, right, among the young people today. So who wants to take that first? Okay, yeah, just brief. Okay, uh, if I may share, in Abim, we have our own culture, uh, uh, or you, you know, when we talk about the youth trending, or we always call it as tambring. Um, we for this time is too fast. Uh, we have a lot of young people, very potential young people, but of course need to be trained. But of course they have their own particular uh, way of thinking. Okay. If you approach them, we have to approach them within their own uh, way of thinking as well. You know, how to strike the balance. Uh, because uh, throughout our uh, uh, experience, uh, we have this kind of categorization uh, process. How to cater the young activists of ABI in universities and so on. And B, uh, of course, when we have a new membership of ABI, I mean, uh, uh, as family first, for example, uh, we, when we conduct a program, we, we conduct a program, for example, the, the, the program called as Perkabungan Menara Guiding. We give some enlightenment uh, to them on uh, the views of university students. I mean, what should you do or what will you do when you are in, this, in, in the university? So, the Tamrin or the training program or what is called camp uh, for the young people at the early stage before they enter into universities is very important. And, and that's what we keep organizing uh, annually every year. We call it as Pekan-Pekan uh, Menara uh, Gading. Even not only in KL, but also across the state, in many states. And of course, uh, there are also 
uh, participants who left out of I mean our program because maybe the decision is not suitable for them. But uh, it, it's okay so long as we have a bunch of group of young people before entering into universities, we train them. Uh, and of course, we need to strike a balance because, as I said, and I think uh, Prof also said that uh, they have their own way of life in terms of uh, thinking, uh, uh, let alone our children nowadays. I mean, my generation, uh, they are post COVID 19 generation, you know, they know how to use Zoom better than us, for example. So, this shapes their own uh, way of thinking. But at the end of the day, in terms of organizational value, I mean, we have our own values, we need to stick uh, how to approach the other day and how to approach professionally. Because at the end of the day, uh, you have to show to... I mean, if you say that you are, that, that you are a hero of the, of the nation or outside, you have to show your quality. So that's why you have to stick with certain qualities, criteria, values that need to be done. And that's the reason why uh, we approach SPM leaders, for example, um, so that they have their own uh, mindset in, I mean, before entering to universities and before contribute more to the society. I think for me, it's it's uh, it's a real challenge, right? The idea of uh, instant gratification, because essentially every generation has its cultural context, and um, the fortunate or unfortunate part about uh, about this generation is that you grow up in an era where everything you can get very quickly. You know, you want your fast food, you don't even have to drive for fast food. You can get it even faster by just coming to stay at home, right? So it's like a faster fast food, right? Uh, so uh, I think that's, that's, that's one thing that, we are, that we're looking at right now. That you can essentially get any information, any communication, but also I think the, the, the real challenge is that you're comparing yourself actively between your life and your situation with someone else's life because there's a constant exposure. That's the, that's the part that's difficult also, right? So that also makes you very impatient and you, have, you, you become someone who's very, very unable to tolerate slowness and tolerate the process. Mm. And that's a very, very difficult thing because when you say, okay, this person is my age, tapi dah ada kereta mewah, tapi dah ada rumah, rumah mahal, girlfriend lawa, I was, I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I can I can, I can, I can cari, cari, cari. And then in the end, they get very frustrated because they don't know how to jump to that level without realizing that this person is from a wealthy family. This person has many advantages that they didn't have, right? So there is a process. I think it's, of course, for us with, uh, with Undi 18, uh, we, uh, from a political perspective, that's why we do our programs and we try to educate uh, people about the reality about Malaysian politics because I think often, you know, um, us in urban centers, in urban areas, we are very disconnected with those who are in semi-rural rural areas in terms of our politics. And if we want to change Malaysian politics, we have to be able to navigate the differences, urban, rural, semi-rural and all that, right? So that's what we try to do. But as a general greater philosophy of change, honestly, I, I think we can do as much as you, the, all of you in universities, to be honest, right? In universities, in institutes of learning. I believe one of the most powerful elements to learn about human interaction and the pain and the, and the annoying, the annoyingness and the struggle and the drama is when you're in university, right? You know, through persatuan, through assignments, through group work, right? These are all where you learn about the, what do you call it, the, the spices and also the, uh, the, the not so tasty parts about human behavior, right? And I think that gives you a very good clarity about how to make things work. So I do, I, th I think I do encourage really that um, that I, I mean, it's something that I've always believed, and, I, and when people ask me about only eighteen and my and my belief, I believe that we must rethink what it means to be, you know, a mahasiswa. We must not just think as a mahasiswa as someone who is good and can get a good job, but you must think uh, as a mahasiswa as a good citizen. That means not only are they good at, as as an economic model insight, but they should also should be model democracy, right? That they should also be able to be to be understand how politics works, but also be able to integrate into society. I think these are core elements that we are perhaps missing out. Of course, it's not easy because, uh, you know, as administrators or as, as school, uh, as university uh, lecturers, you, you have two years where people didn't go to university, right? Everything was on Zoom, so you really couldn't everything, right? And I'm sure many persatuan in university also sudah mati. You know, many, many times, well, from what I hear, is not so active and all that stuff. But I think now that people are coming back to university, 
time to revive it, time to re-emphasize it, and I'm sure through syllabus and curriculum, and also pushing school administrators, you can put a greater emphasis on this. Because I think education system is the best way to develop you as a citizen and also society as a whole. Right? So if we can even teach them uh, or teach you know, the, the current university students even 10% to have a little bit of patience, a little bit of appreciating the process, I think we'll be a little bit better of, uh, as a society. So I hope that sort of, sort, of, sort of answers it. But again, it's a very difficult situation and it's a very diff difficult culture that we're in. Like. Yes, it is. It is. Yeah, yeah it is. But, but I, think, I think the important thing is that it's a shared responsibility. We do our part, but each of us try to do each of our part within our realms of control. Happy Anything to add up? Uh, I have a long answer. But I'll try to keep it short. So for TFM, I think um, we, we, because we, I think, yeah, 90% our, yeah, ninety percent of our staff, uh, we have, I think, around 60 employees and 90% of them are in the youth category. So we are the fast food or faster and fast food generation. And, and it is very, very true that like what you said, um, they want everything fast. Not not only in a in an instant gratification, like you know, who go to Shopee, buy something, I want it tomorrow. But it also I can see that being translated like we engage government and then uh, for, for a policy change and then when we get rejected we're like ah yeah let's just give up you know that's one of the problems that we face internally also just that like mental burnout and also very easily upset by just one one obstacle uh, and, and I like to I like to learn from both or many sides of, of the, the demography from people your age or people your generation the middle one and then also the young ones I think a lot of benefits there are there are a lot of advantages that we can learn from different uh, ages from all, all people from all ages uh, I think from from the, the older generation I think the way you, you, you do things there's a lot there's a lot of like you know because back then it's not as there's no email there's it's only surat manurat or telephone there's a lot of appreciation uh, in terms of face-to-face -face engagement which is very very critical actually right now you cannot just do zoom call with a minister <laughs> and ask for approval right these are the this is when we learn the ropes of how they how they how do people do it back in the days yeah so so i think we always make sure that we need to take a step back and okay let's try a different you know various approach rather than you know everything just digital and fast yeah so so that's something that we are we are doing and another thing is um educating our 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 the staff or our youth in our organization is we have internal management uh, fellowship training where we teach them about uh, project management structure financial governance because to all of our staff we think uh, we think about them as you know you don't have to stay for the sake of staying or just like being loyal but we want to de develop you so that when you go out you can be a CEO or, 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 or a founder of your own startup or, or organization like one of the co-founders of only 18 was from TFM also and now she's like you know flying high <laughs> doing her thing through only 18 and many more so these are the, the great examples that we want to do we want to inculcate and, and um, educate them with these values how do you structure or, or build an establishment or build a, an organization so that when you leave you 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 yeah you can do a lot of other things yeah i think those are some of the answers i have thank you thank you so much for these wonderful uh, answers i think we really really uh, learn a lot you know from uh, this feedback given by the panelists so i guess uh, time is really not on our side so before we end the session i would like to once again invite each panelist to share with us your final thoughts what do you want the audience to take away with regards to today's topic the role of youth in civilization and sustainability so probably we'll start with Hafiz first you know Hafiz we have been always you know keeping you the last person so i think uh, you start first yeah. <laughs> i would like to just to, to end this right i would like to just read uh, a book that i read during the pandemic 
is by Prof. Unku Aziz um, because we are in UM and the title is Mahasiswa Menggugat yeah, I was very very attracted to the title because it sounds very anti-establishment and very activist of him to, to write uh, and, and this is uh, an excerpt from the book uh, which goes Sebagai penutup pesanan saya ialah Biarlah mahasiswa mencabar Asalkan sambil itu mereka belajar Belajar sambil mencabar Pengetahuan tidak terjuntai Seperti pisang Bangsamu tidak termaju Tanpa pemimpin Berpengalaman mencabar dan terpelajar I think this this pantun encapsulates everything that we just discussed Like the, the, the thing pengetahuan tidak terjuntai seperti pisang is there's no shortcut to, to success or like quick wins to, to, to a, a transformation or change and then you need a leader to lead and you need education to overcome you know all these challenges. Thank you so much Hafiz for that beautiful, beautiful words that you have shared with us. Thank you so much. Yes, Tama? I think I want to, want to just share that in crisis there is opportunity. In uncertainty there is opportunity to build and create. So while we are having this sense of loss of hope, the sense of uncertainty now, but each of us in this room, each of us who are listening, have the opportunity to become that person that makes that change happen. I think that's something that I, I do want to emphasize. And also, whether or not you are pro-establishment, anti-establishment, I think, I think that is something that matters less to me. But the most important is this, are you pro-justice? Are you pro the truth? Are you pro social good? And are you pro humanity? I think these are the key things that we must ask. And if we are having this as our guidance, then hopefully we'll be able to achieve that change that we need and be able to build a better civilization and also a better nation for Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Really the face of a genius. <laughs> Okay, um, when we talk about civilization, civilization dialogue, we need to understand the prerequisite of civilization is interactions, sharing uh, common values. Uh, it is all about human beings, you know, um, develop human beings apart. In, uh, and it is not just about propagating one uh, secluded, exclusive community. And that's why uh, in Abim, we, we always discuss about uh, the book written by Huntington, The Clash of Civilization. It is really taboo in terms of uh, their contents, you know, uh, empowering the white supremacy of civilization without recognizing the uh, the value of civilization in Asia, India, uh, China, Babylon, and so on. And if you look or if you read uh, what was written by Peter Frankopan, he, he narrates where Alexander the Great was in India, Babylon, and China, and take a lot of treasures brought back to their home place and build their own civilization. So that means there is no single uh, superpower or uh, I mean a uh, superpower racial card that can be played in terms of building the civilization. And it was also said by Ton B, uh, when when you talk about a superpower in terms of one race in building the civilization, it is considered as uh, egocentric illusion. And it was also stated by uh, Ortega y Gatse. No one superpower race that can claim they can build one civilization. At the end of the day, when we talk about civilization, civilization dialogue, it's about sharing wealth, sharing expertise, sharing good values. And that's what propagated by Abimez. Cosmopolitan, we are living in terms of developing the quality of life of ourselves and also quality of life of our future generations and that's why when we talk about climate change or climate issues when we talk about environment I think we try to use religion as a language to unify uh, all communities uh, instead of looking at you know racial hatred and so on how can we solve this environment problem from the perspective of religion and inshallah at least we can defend the rights of quality of life of our future generation thank you Mr. Malaya for inviting us Thank you so much, Faisal. Another face of a genius, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so 
Thank you so much, everyone. So to end today's forum, I would like to take this opportunity to share a short quotation from Mr. Dai Saku Ikeda, the president of Soka Gakai International, because we also have the NGO Soka Gakai with us here today. So basically, Soka Gakai International is an NGO that promotes peace, culture, and education, particularly education for sustainable development and climate uh, action. So in his annual peace proposal to the United Nations this year, Mr. Ikeda wrote, quote, Listening to the voices of young people is not optional. It is the only logical path forward if we are genuinely concerned about the future of our world. Human beings inherently possess the strength to overcome any challenge. When youth stand up in solidarity, confident that they can determine the future, this fresh awareness and momentum will surely become the driving force towards a brighter future." Unquote. So I can imagine the impact it will have in our Malaysian society when we have you from ABIM, when we have you from UNDI 18, when we have you from Teach for Malaysia and other NGOs coming together, working for the betterment of our shared civilization and sustainability, we will definitely have a very bright and promising future. So with that, I would like to conclude today's forum so please join me once again in thanking our distinguished panelists once again for sharing their very insightful thoughts and wisdom with us on this very important topic. Thank you so much. Over back to the MC. Thank you so much to our moderator and panel members for the great session today. Without further ado, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Zulila Muzukli Lopez to come on the stage to give the token of appreciation from UMCCD to moderator and panel members. Please welcome our moderator, Associate Professor Dr. Wendy, Director, Center for Internship Training and Academic Enrichment, Chitra University Malaya. Speakers, Mr. Muhammad Faisal Abdul Aziz, President Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia Abim. <laughs> Mr. Tarma Pilai, Advocacy, Director Undi 18. <laughs> Mr. Muhammad Hafiz Benordin, Director of Finance and Operation Yang Santish Commission. Thank you so much to Associate Professor Dr. Zul Ilham for the token of appreciation. We have come to the end of our forum today. I would like to thank everyone that have participated and contributed directly or indirectly in making this event success. Now, I would like to invite everyone to enjoy the lunch that we have prepared today. Thank you and have a nice day.